by the time you're in the 50s and 60s, if you have not taken care of your vasculature, you're going to have stiff arteries, calcification. Yes, you may not have had a heart attack yet, but your physiology is being set up to either have a stroke, heart attack, or heart failure. So what is vitamin K2? It's a vitamin that's unheard of. K1 maybe, but K2? So today I'm gonna to teach you about calcium and vitamin K2 and why I'm so interested in it. Because I think that this is a very important chapter in our understanding of what's causing blockages in the arteries of the body. So let's just dive right into it. There was another study done called the EPIC study, and it showed that for every 10 micrograms of vitamin K2, in your diet that you take. There's a 9% reduction in cardiovascular risk. I take that any day. Show me which of my medicines can do that. A few, very few. So in the EPIC study, there's a direct correlation. The higher your intake of vitamin K2, the lower your cardiovascular risk. Nine, nine. So if you're consuming 40, nine times four. I mean, that's almost 50% reduction in cardiovascular risk. Um, so the references are all listed. And th this was an amazing study. So this was a beautiful study. It was published in Atherosclerosis in 2009, showing patients with low vitamin K2 intake have the worst coronary calcification. And those with the highest at the lowest amount of coronary calcification. There was another Dutch study that was done, and they looked at 180 micrograms of MK7. MK7, this is the preparation that we use of vitamin K2. And this, as I said before, comes from fermented products. And it showed not only cardiovascular risk reduction, but these patients had much better bone density, less fractures, strength of the bones as well. This was a 2007 study. Then there were further studies done that the patients who were given vitamin K2 supplements, they had improved pulse wave velocities and carotid artery distensibility. So what does that mean? That means it's improving the elasticity of the blood vessels. How does it do that? Well, obviously, if there's less calcium build up in that artery wall in the smooth muscle, which I explained to you before, then that artery is going to be more distensible. So if it's more distensible, what, so what? Well, what happens is that the systolic blood pressure will be lower because when the heart pumps into a rigid tube, the systolic blood pressure is going to be higher because there's nothing accommodating that stroke volume. But when there's more distensibility, that means there's more compliance in the blood vessel because there's less calcium, it's less rigid, you're going to get a lower systolic blood pressure. And we know that systolic blood pressure directs has a direct correlation to coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, and total mortality. So what happens to a diastolic blood pressure? Diastolic blood pressures, patients given vitamin K2 supplements have a better diastolic pressure as well because you don't want a very low diastolic pressure because a low diastolic pressure decreases coronary perfusion because coronary perfusion occurs in diastolic. So what happens is if you have vitamin K2 deficiency, you're going to get a high systolic pressure because of non-distensibility of your Richard tubes, your aorta and everything else. And you get a lower diastolic pressure because there's no recoil of the aorta because diastolic pressure is caused by recoil of the aorta. So it's a double whammy. You don't want stiff arteries. You don't want calcium building. And by the way, this process of stiffening of the arteries and losing its elasticity starts in your 20s. So I hope I have your attention here. It starts in your 20s. By the time you're in the 50s and 60s, if you have not taken care of your vasculature, you're going to have stiff arteries, calcification. Yes, you may not have uh, had a heart attack yet, but your physiology is being set up to either have a stroke, heart attack, or heart failure. So I give my patients vitamin K2, and my diet has to improve. Diets of what? Eat fermented foods, fermented foods. So the Japanese eat a lot of natto, you know, N-A-T-T-O, right? That's fermented soybeans, right? Right? If you have a taste for it, then you should have it, because that has the highest concentration of vitamin K2. Next is hard cheese, like gouda, the hard cheese gouda, very high concentration of vitamin K2. Then comes other cheese like the brie, the French cheeses. They have a lot of vitamins in it because it's the fermentation products. The bacteria produce the vitamin K2 in it. And then kefir comes in there, sauerkraut comes in there. They also have a lot of vitamin K2, but much less than the first few ones that I already mentioned. So our regular meats have MK4 and our eggs have MK4. If you have farm-raised, free-roaming chicken, they'll have vitamin 
K2 as well, but they have to be free roaming. They've got to be eating what they would normally eat in their normal life, not the feeds that we're giving them. Same thing with the eggs. So any opportunity I get to do that, that's the way to go. And then worst case scenario, the patients who already have some calcification or are very high risk also, I give them vitamin K2 supplementation. There was a study to show that there was less prostatic cancer and spread of cancer in patients who had the highest levels of vitamin K2 in their body and osteodystrophy in renal failure patients. Now, you know, one of the biggest problems with renal failure patients is that they get calcification of non-osseous structures. So when they come to me, I see the coronary calcium score is extremely high, the carotids are calcified, the aorta is calcified, the aortic valve is calcified. And again, those patients used to be given calcium. So in your bone, for example, you have two types of cells, the osteoclast and your osteoblasts. The osteoblasts, they build up bone. That means they take calcium from the bloodstream, push it into the bone. So you get nice, strong bones. Osteoclasts, they destroy the bone. So they destroy the bone, they demineralize the bone, they take the calcium out. So the way it works is that you need osteocalcin to bind the calcium, but to activate the osteocalcin, you need vitamin K2. So if you do not have vitamin K2 in your body, you're not going to get carboxylation of these chemicals called osteocalcin. And this in the tissues, the counterpart of that is called matrix GLA protein. So this protein has to be activated by two things, vitamin D and vitamin K2. Now in the tissues, this chemical does a different thing. It takes calcium, binds to it, and moves it into the bloodstream, out of the tissues. So in the bone, it causes deposition of calcium, but in the tissues, it pulls calcium out of the tissues, takes it into the bloodstream so that it can then head on off to the bones. So these matrix GLA proteins, what are they doing in the tissues and where are they being produced? They're produced by the smooth muscle cells of the blood vessels. So the blood vessels, they have smooth muscle cells. That's where they can vasodilate and vasoconstrict. They make this protein. This protein has to be activated by vitamin K2. When it's activated, it'll bind calcium and move it out of the blood vessel. When vitamin K2 is not there, there's nothing to take the calcium out of the blood vessel. When the vitamin K2 is not there for the bone, the bone will not be able to mineralize because that particular protein in the bone binds to hydroxyapatite and then the calcium gets trapped in the bone. So where does vitamin K2 come from? Now there are two sources of vitamin K2. One is animal sources and the other one is my favorite fermented products. See, it's all coming together. Why, why, why I've been encouraging fermented products? So let's look at uh, vitamin K2, also known as uh, menaquinone. Annual one is called MK4, and the one that comes from the uh, fermented products is called MK7. MK7 is a longer molecule. It is biologically more active as well. It is found in some meats, some eggs, dairy, and fermented products. So vitamin K2, why would vitamin K2 deficiency happen if people are eating lots of meat, eggs, chicken? Because the quality of the meat is also going down. If your animal was not eating green chloroplasts, green natural grass foods, that meat is not going to have enough vitamin K2 also. The eggs, eggs are supposed to have a lot of vitamin K2, but today's eggs are all fed grains and grains don't have vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 has to come from the original product, which means nature. Nature has to provide it first. So when it goes through the cycles of the animals, that's when vitamin K2 levels go up. Fermented foods make vitamin K2. The fermentation products make vitamin K2. So vitamin K2 gets into the body, it activates all the uh, MGPs, and in the bones, you're gonna get strong bones, and in the blood vessels, you're gonna get inhibition of calcification.